Hi folks, this is Astronomy Live. Back in January, I measured the size of Earth by making measurements of the elevation of the North Celestial Pole from a couple of locations directly due north and south of each other. By also measuring the distance I traveled between those locations, I was able to determine the circumference and therefore the diameter and radius of our planet. I was also able to rule out flat Earth by looking at how far I should travel to find myself directly underneath the North Celestial Pole if Earth were flat, and I found that distance to be far too small that it would only get me as far north as Canada in reality. Since then, flat earthers have claimed that I cannot make measurements off the side of a curved surface, that I need a flat surface to serve as a baseline, and therefore I can't possibly be measuring the size of the Earth, and in fact, by leveling the telescope, they claim that I've proven that Earth is actually flat. We're going to test that theory in this video, using this armillary sphere. This armillary sphere is intended to provide a model of the sky above us with Earth at the middle, but in this video we will use it as a model for a spherical Earth instead, the reason being that with this model I can run wires through it to provide an artificial pole star with a laser diode. I can also run a physical cord line between points on its outer surface. You can see around the perimeter we have 10 degree markings and we can use this to model different points along the outer surface at different latitudes. You see, flat earthers have also claimed that I would need to physically tunnel through the Earth in order to measure the distance between points on the Earth's surface, which I did using mathematics instead in the video measuring the distance to the Sun. So, in this video, what we're going to do is replicate the methodology that I used to measure the size of the Earth, but instead we're going to measure the size of this armillary sphere. We'll then run a physical cord length between two distantly separated points and see if we can come up with that same distance mathematically instead of having to physically run a line between those points. To do all of this, I also need a miniature version of my telescope, so I created that using an IMU or inertial measurement unit that I taped to this camera. The camera is a small USB camera that I use for tracking rocket launches and satellites, and in this case it will be used as a model for the telescope itself. The IMU is plugged into an Arduino that I programmed to show me the elevation angle the camera is pointed at, and it's calibrated by pressing a button that notifies the program that it is pointing either straight up or straight down. Let's now take a look at the Altitude Azimuth Coordinate System to understand how this works and how we can get accurate angle measurements off the side of a curved surface, such as this model of an armillary sphere. This is a 3D model of the Altitude Azimuth Coordinate System that we will be using in this video, just as I used back in January when measuring the size of the Earth. The blue grid represents Altitude Azimuth Coordinates and the red line represents the angle to a target. The yellow line represents the line directly from the observer to the zenith, the point in the sky directly above the observer. The green line represents the astronomical horizon, and this is defined quite simply as being 90 degrees from the zenith. So if we find the highest point in the sky, the astronomical horizon is, by definition, simply 90 degrees from that point, around all 360 degrees of azimuth. The angle between the red line to the target and the yellow line straight above you to the zenith is called the zenith distance, and the elevation above the astronomical horizon defined by the green line is simply the reciprocal of this angle, 90 degrees minus the zenith distance. So in my videos, when I say that a target is a certain number of degrees of elevation above the horizon, I'm referring to the astronomical horizon in this coordinate system. I'm not referring to an apparent horizon or a geometric horizon. Even on a curved surface, we can use this coordinate system because we're referencing it relative to the zenith, which is simply the point directly above us, and it doesn't matter what the shape is of the ground below us. When I level the tripod of the telescope with a bubble level, where is that bubble pointing? Is it pointing at the horizon? No, the bubble is facing the zenith, directly above where the telescope is standing. And so this is why I can use this coordinate system to make measurements regardless of the shape that it's standing on. Let's take a look at how this works on a sphere. 
In this example, the armillary sphere will be projecting a laser to represent an artificial pole star, and we will have two observer positions on the side of the sphere using the altitude azimuth coordinate system, with yellow lines representing their zenith, and red lines representing the elevation of the target above an astronomical horizon represented by the green circles. Of course, the astronomical horizon of each location, as shown by the green circles, are not level relative to each other. They are tangents on the side of the sphere. They are 90 degrees from the yellow line connecting the observer to the zenith, and of course, if the zenith is directly above you, then if we extend these yellow lines in the opposite direction, they connect to the center of the sphere that both observers are standing on. Placing the back of my camera against the side of the armillary sphere, I calibrate it to tell it that it is pointed at the zenith, 90 degrees above the astronomical horizon. I then tilt the camera down to point it where the laser is shining on the ceiling. From this first observer position on the side of the sphere, I get an elevation of the pole star above the astronomical horizon of about 50.51 degrees. I then move the camera to a second observer location I've marked with red tape, I calibrate the zenith point, and then tilt it down to point at the pole star once again. From this second observer location further south from the pole, I now have an elevation of the pole star above the astronomical horizon of 22.49 degrees. I then laid a piece of string between the two observer locations that I marked with red tape, and measured the distance over the surface of the sphere between the two observer locations at 1.5 inches. I also measured the distance to the North Pole on this sphere using red tape along the surface from the northernmost observer location, and found that it had a distance of 2 and 5 eighths inches. If you recall this figure from my previous video measuring the size of the Earth, we can now start to fill in the information for this much smaller sphere in this tabletop experiment. If we take our data and we try to fit it to a flat Earth model, we can use the law of signs to find the slant range between the northern location and our pole star, and we get an answer of 1.22 inches. Then, we can find the distance we would have to travel on this flat Earth to reach the North Pole, where the pole star would be directly above us, and we find that that distance would be only 0.78 inches. Again, we already measured this distance as being slightly more than 2.5 inches, nowhere near the value predicted if we assume a flat Earth. Rejecting a flat Earth for a spherical Earth, the 28.02 degree difference between the two positions and a distance of 1.5 inches gives us a circumference of 19.27 inches. With a spherical circumference of 19.27 inches, if we divide this by pi, we find the diameter of the sphere should be about 6.13 inches, according to our measurements. And if we take a tape measure to the sphere, we find that its actual physical diameter is indeed 6 inches. Now you might be wondering, didn't I just prove the stars might be much closer than they're supposed to be? Well, if that were true, we ought to see significant amounts of topocentric parallax. That means parallax that is induced by our position on the Earth. Two observers on widely spaced portions of this planet would see different diameters of star trails surrounding the North Celestial Pole depending on where they are on their planet. As I showed in my video earlier this year, Polaris is not exactly at the North Celestial Pole, and it does trace a circle around the North Celestial Pole. Observers on this planet would not be able to agree on how far Polaris is from the North Celestial Pole. You can see in this blinking animation from two different observer locations on this spherical planet that we would get slightly different sizes of Polaris relative to the North Celestial Pole, and this would be immediately obvious to anyone with a telescope. Let's now proceed to the final point in this video, determining whether it's possible to accurately calculate the chord length distance between two distant locations on the surface of this planet without having to physically tunnel through the planet to measure that distance. As seen in our Distance to the Sun video, the chord length is the yellow line that connects two distant locations on the surface of the planet, and yes, it runs through the planet. But is it necessary to actually tunnel through the planet to measure this distance? Let's take a look. As you can see here, I've taped a piece of string taut between two distant locations on the armillary sphere, one marked by 20 degrees and one marked by 90 degrees, for a total angular separation between these two locations of 70 degrees. We can plug this directly into my spreadsheet for calculating chord length distance. 
We will also change the radius of this model of Earth to equal the radius that we measured for the sphere earlier in this video using the angular measurements. We determined a diameter of 6.13 inches, so dividing that by 2 we get a radius of 3.065 inches. Plugging in the angular separation between the two locations of 70 degrees, we determine that the chord length distance should be about 3.5 inches. This in turn matches perfectly with the length of the string that we measure between those two positions. We can therefore conclude that we don't need to physically tunnel through the Earth in order to measure this distance. We can simply calculate it using the coordinates of two observer locations on the Earth. So let's summarize these findings. By using the zenith, we are able to make useful angular measurements off the side of a curved surface like a sphere. We can distinguish between a flat Earth and a roughly spherical Earth using our measurements. And using our measurements, we can find the size of a spherical Earth. And once we've done that, we can determine the chord length distance between two distant observers on the side of that spherical Earth using the angular separation between their coordinates. That does it for this video, so until next time, thanks for watching, and clear skies, folks.